the alabaster saga is overwhelming like i needed notes to keep up with this stuff the story just keeps on uh giving you refreshers like hey are you are you sure you got this no i'm not because alabasta has so many locations but also we didn't get to see all of them like for example in Django's cover story it shows a new island uh, from East Blue, the Mirror Ball Island, where they like meet full body and dance together. And all these pages, these cover pages, make it feel like the world is still moving and there's still areas that we haven't explored, even if they're behind us now. And it was in like the SBS corner where Odo was saying like, oh yeah, there's more stuff here. I just, I just couldn't show it. And I believe it. This, this one was packed. And the whole length of Alabasta is like from the start all the way to Baratier. This arc is 60 chapters. It is insane. And so I realized that these sagas are, are kind of like books. It's weird saying that when I read the manga, which is like literally a book, but it is just formatted in a different way that I haven't seen from manga or anime. Because now I think I get it. Like East Blue has a solid beginning, middle and end. And Alabasta has this like very specific, it starts here, beginning, middle, and end. And it feels like a book. It feels like, all right, you read East Blue, now read Alabasta. There you go. There's your new book. <laughs> there, there's, the, there's the sequel. It feels like here's the sequel book, Alabasta, to the original, which was East Blue. It feels like it's split up into like the setup, which is the other islands, until we transition into like the second half of the story, which... Like, you could tell me that this is going to just become a desert story, and for how long it's taking, I would have believed it. Since it takes up, like, 50 chapters, I would have been like, okay, yeah, I guess this is a desert story now. And I think a lot of it boils down to the smart writing. Like, you have an end goal, which is Alabasta, the Sand Kingdom, and from there, you have these themes that you know you want to talk about and develop. So you have Drum Island and you're like, okay, there she's going to be a royal. There she's going to show a lot of uh, what makes her royal status, what makes her worthy of being a royal. And then, you know, you rewind it back to Baroque Works and you get a lot of the plot. You get a lot of like, okay, here is where you need to go in order to get to the end goal. And because you get this like sort of island by island status, I feel like you get a little bit of leeway in order to develop not only each island, but to build up stakes and to further understand what's going to happen by the time you get to the end goal. It is um, the writing strat of starting at the end and then working your way backwards. And it works. It's smart. All right, so we have Alabasta. It is a desert island. I had been praising a snow island. I had been wanting a snow island for so long. But now we get the complete opposite. We get a sand island. And, you know, it puts them in a ton of situations that you would kind of expect from uh, a desert island, right? They have uh, to change costumes to adapt to the climate. And the water is a bigger priority than it used to before. But also, it's not just a regular desert landscape. There's uh, fast walking cro <laughs> crabs. There is fast walking crabs. And my personal favorite, a sand pyramid casino with like its own banana crocodile murder hole. I mean, every casino needs its own crocodile banana murdering hole. That's just, that's just standard. And so sure, you have your own amazing uh, sand pyramid casino, but also simultaneously, the entire place is just in a state of drought because as people suspect, the king has used dance powder to steal all of the water vapor from all of the clouds nearby to just give their side of the kingdom almost exclusively all the rain. And you know, in, in the back of my mind, I'm kind of thinking like, okay, is this going to be like another king equals bad story? Is this going to be like another will pull? But like, is Vivi's dad like the bad guy? But, but no, it's Crocodile. Crocodile is the bad guy. Very much the bad guy. They say so themselves, like in the introduction, just like, I'm not here for you. Which are like, okay, buddy, you, you could have hidden that a little bit better. I liked the concept of a warlord protecting an island from other pirates. I feel like that has to be a thing eventually, right? Like like a warlord or a powerful pirate who does actually protect the people. But nope, Crocodile's just there for the loot and like saving people is like not really a priority. So they're very villainous. It's very cliche, but you know what? It works. I like Crocodile. Like they're very cunning and very menacing and they have that sort of Hawkeye vibe where they know they're the strongest and they don't have to prove themselves. 
So for Crocodile, you have like another long plot in the making. And I'm thinking, oh no, is this going to be another Clawdor situation where there's this like overly complicated story in order for pirates to get treasure? And the answer is kind of, but also it's better. Like for a full on war, you kind of need to play the long con. And two years, honestly, two years to change the opinion of an entire country isn't even that long of a con. Like Kuro was trying to manipulate one person for like three years. Kuro is like playing a weird game of checkers while Crocodile is in like the grandmaster stage of playing 4D chess. Like, Crocodile is, like, gaslighting and lying and spreading propaganda and, like, straight-up manipulating all of Alabasta. Baroque Works is amongst the people. Like, Baroque Works is inside the, like, Alabasta's government. Like, Mr. Two is pretending to shapeshift into the king. And, I mean, that's powerful stuff. It's hard to be like, wait, hold on, that, that king's not actually the king. Uh, they're like a shapeshifter. It's like, nobody's gonna believe you, buddy. So it's effective. Crocodile's effective. And for 60 chapters, it's really just throwing curveballs at you. Like, I kind of knew the general story beats, right? Like, at some point, they're gonna meet Smoker, uh, Ace, Tashigi. They're gonna beat up Crocodile. But it was very different than I thought it would be. Like, Tashigi and Zoro just didn't fight. They barely even met each other. Instead, Tashigi goes on, like, a long adventure and reshapes her own sense of justice and the world government. And Smoker does, too. Uh, upon almost drowning, they're rescued by the Straw Hats, making them, again, <laughs> have to rethink their own sense of justice, especially when later on they're rewarded for an act that they just didn't accomplish. Like, it shakes things up so much. It, like, changes your opinion of the justice system that you've taken part in. And, like, what does this say about Crocodile or Luffy? What does it say about, like, the people who go up and down the ranks and the people who offer bounties? What does this say about the world government as a whole who handles the aftermath of all of this? Oh, man. All right. Um, there's also Ace, who I don't think we really saw up close in, uh, in Drum Island at all, right? But now we learn that they're like Luffy's brother and they're uh, apparently smarter. I mean, they did fall asleep while eating. So I don't know if I believe that one. I also like Ace's outfit, which is weird to say when I've written it down because it's like two pieces of clothing. I like the, I just like the fact that Luffy has a straw hat and, and Ace has a cowboy hat. And we see uh, Ace hand Luffy... I think uh, an empty piece of paper, which is uh, which is a little bit strange, but it's very cute that Luffy uh, wanted to put that little piece of paper into the straw hat. I think I saw some like artwork a bit ago of that straw hat with a little piece of paper on it. And it's so cute. It's like, I don't know what this is for, but you gave it to me. So it must be important. And it uses a lot of what I've been thinking, which is again, that we're using A to highlight B. Right? We're using the paper to highlight something. I don't exactly know what that thing is. But also we get like Ace, which highlights Whitebeard, which is interesting. It's this like a pirate captain that we haven't heard of before. And also it introduces Blackbeard, who we heard a little bit about in Drum Island and who Ace says has killed a crew member. So it's like, okay, the plot thickens. There's going to be something there. And so Ace can't stick around. It's their job to get Blackbeard. So they got to leave. I think I'm just at that point where I just accept an introduction or an exit. I'm just like, yeah, okay, that, that happened. Upon seeing Ace, like the two thoughts in my head were like, one, who is this Ace guy? And two, how strong is Ace? Ace has, like, the fire fruit, and they handled Smoker really well. They also have, like, a fire-type uh, boat deal going on. Would you get tired of just using your abilities like that? Like, you gotta wonder, is using your abilities free, or do you think it's, like, rowing? Like, using a fire jet is, like, rowing. You get me? Huh? Huh? It's, what are you talking about? Using fire is like rowing. And we see the Marines going after Ace and the Straw Hats and Ace just like destroys multiple ships with his fire ability. And I'm thinking, is this how power leveling works? Like instead of like, oh, what's your power level or what's your bounty? It's like, no, no, no. How many ships 
have you destroyed single-handedly in one move? Anyways, getting back on track, I'm surprised that it took a while to get to Crocodile. Not in the same way that, like, Arlong Park took a while to get to Fish Guy. Arlong! I'm, I'm an idiot. Not in the same way that Arlong Park took a while to get to Arlong. Like, not in a narrative way, but just, like, in an actual distance way. It takes a while to get to Crocodile. Like, what? Uh, multiple days? Many hours? And even when they're found, it, it's still a struggle. Like, Crocodile locks them up in, like, the sea prism cell, where we learn what, like, that material is that stops people from uh, using their ability. We see that Smoker carries, like, a sea prism stick. Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds about right. That's good enough. Like, even when they escape, it is, it is not an easy fight. Like, there is still multiple Baroque members. The whole crew has to go into fights. We got, like, Nami versus the, the Spike Fruit lady which shows off a lot of Navi's intelligence and we also get like chopper and Usopp versus uh the mole fruit merry christmas lady and i think it's this fight that made me realize that i think i kind of like Usopp. so they're very cowardly and they have their flaws but Usopp also has like their moments where even though <laughs> they're they're getting destroyed and they're getting beat up they have this like ability to give like an empowering speech while you're getting plummeted on the other side we get zoro versus uh the sword fruit where zoro has to uh in this fight learn how to cut simultaneously through everything and also has to learn how to cut through nothing and we also get like my favorite baroque's member the dog gun the gun dog who has eaten the dog fruit it is not a dog who has eaten a gun fruit it is a gun who has eaten a dog fruit which, okay, you know what? I, I kind of called it, though. I called it. I was like, oh, yeah, why not? Concepts could eat each other. Uh, items could eat each other. Like, a barrel could, like, eat a fruit and become it, I guess. And you know what? Gun eats dog and becomes a gun dog. How does that work? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Can you, like, toss a fruit in a chest and have it accidentally spoil and become sentient? Speaking of confusing things, there are a lot of uh, lore elements that I feel like I'm too dumb to understand. There's this like big cube with, with a ton of weird letters that can tell you the history of uh, the world or something. It was very cryptic. The plogger, the py, the pagoras, polyglyph. And so Crocodile is here because there is a polyglyph uh, with all these weird letters that can decipher the history of the world and also uh, apparently contain the secret to where Pluton is, which is this weapon that can destroy entire islands. And Nico Robin lies about its whereabouts? Nico Robin is interesting. We're going to put that on pause a little bit. Nico Robin is interesting. I, I think for that, we could talk about the fight with Crocodile. Luffy had been like waiting to fight Crocodile. They're just like very far into the island. It's like, yeah, go for it. And so Luffy's just like ready. They're ready to go. And when they meet Crocodile, they're like, all right, enough, to <laughs> enough talking. Crocodile is talking and they're giving good exposition. And Luffy just keeps on punching him. He's like, stop talking. I'm trying to kill you. But he can't. He can't lay a finger on Crocodile. Crocodile is so overpowered. And I love it. Like one, Crocodile dries up the entire desert in this like long con. They eliminate their weakness and then they camp out in the desert where they are just in their element. And it takes Luffy not like one or two attempts. It takes Luffy three attempts to beat him. Almost entirely getting destroyed in the process if not saved by nico robin and so we see luffy go through like these stages of combat where they like use their fists and then learn that they can use water and eventually on their last dying breath on the last fight they have to use their blood and even when they defeat him it's still like a barely victory it's still like you barely won it's still like a you barely won kind of situation and throughout all of Alabasta, one of the thoughts that I've had just building is how is this war going to end? This war is based upon drought and like the desperation around it. And and it's like you kind of get it. The king is taking like the limited water for themselves. That is uh, more or less Wapul's situation in Drum Island. 
And now the people had it. They're desperate. There's a huge conflict that's about to happen. There's a war that's about to start. And so Vivi's plan is like, all right, that's fine. I'll just talk to them. I'll just talk to them and talk about the war before it even starts. And that plan gets delayed and you think okay well now what's gonna happen new plan new plan we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna ask politely and then they'll stop but you know that doesn't work and it's like okay new plan let's talk to the leader of the rebellion and you know we'll work things out and they talk out with the leader they learn that crocodiles behind it they learn that there's like a bomb that's gonna go off and when they explain it to this crowd that is fighting it like kind of works but guess what broke works also infiltrated the opposing party and so they're fighting both sides of the war. And sometimes they're not very subtle about it. But I love it. Here in this conflict, there are no easy answers. Like, oh, a dying kid is explaining the ruse and that doesn't stop the war. There's a huge bomb that goes off and Vivi's trying to get their attention. That doesn't work. And it is just as Crocodile is defeated that it just so happens to rain, which finally stops the war. It is such a like poetic closing. All right, a little bit of a side note. I want to talk about Von Clay. Von Clay is like an amazing villain. Their personality, mwah, amazing. But also their ability, especially in this arc, the ability to just like mimic a world power. Von Clay is so thematically relevant. They meet at the start and they become buds. And eventually when the Straw Hats learn that they're a bad guy, they write these X symbols on their arm. And by the end of the story, when Baroque Works is over, the Straw Hats have a giant bounty on them and the whole Marines want them. And so they got to book it and Bond Clay helps them get their ship and uh, their ship is getting destroyed, but they have to wait for Vivi to show up to see if uh, she's going to join and be a royal or not by a certain time. All while their like ship is being destroyed. And Bon Clay, this incredibly goofy villain, gives a heartwarming speech and just sacrifices themselves as the swan ship collapses. And I can't believe that a swan ship made me cry. One of the things that I really hope for in a story is to see the aftermath of a war situation. And for One Piece, it feels like the story of Alabasta isn't entirely done yet. There's still stuff going on here. And so it's totally justifiable that Vivi, a person who has been all about the people, decides to deny their request of becoming a shipmate. However, she asks them if they ever meet up again, will she ever be considered their shipmate? And the Straw Hats can't answer verbally because of the world government. But that beautiful X symbol comes back for like an iconic shot of acceptance. It all comes back around. Maybe that's why I like Bon Clay. They're just like so, such a good thematic villain. Uh, in this book metaphor, the whole saga of Alabasta from beginning to end feels like the somewhat isolated story in a very big collection of books. And now that I think I understand the story structure, I'm very interested to see where Nico Robin is going to end up as a person hunted uh, by the world government. Now more or less joining the Straw Hats, I'm very interested to see what's going to happen in this like potential next chapter of the story. <coughs> I'm not going to do it. 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 I